Uh, my name is Diane Saunders, and I'm from Argyle, and I have kind of a question, but this man back here kind of asked it also, <clears throat> is why are spending $2 million, billion dollars, to sending to Brazil for drilling, and then <clears throat> we're sending another $2.84 billion to Colombia for a refinery, <clears throat> and the United States has not built a new refinery in 35 years. So this would kind of like, if we didn't do this, we put people to work here, and then we're paying people to do this, and then we're paying for the oil to come back. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, you know, Diane, I agree with that. I think what we need to do is be energy independent. And that means that we should work all energy sources, including uh, oil and refineries right here in America. This is a political difference that in this case, I think, won't be impacted until we go to ballot in 2012. But, uh, you know, when it comes to energy, we should be addressing energy across the whole spectrum. I mean, there, we, we, should, we should stop talking about energy independence and actually start doing it. The, the problem is, is, what we haven't talked about here tonight is that every energy source has some opponents. And this is the difficulty of this, is what I would ask is that, is that we should let science, you know, lead the way on you know, and, and that's why, you know, for me, I mean, that, that's why I'm stepping forward. Is there political risk in stepping forward on energy? Absolutely. I'm sure there are probably a lot of people that hate me over it, but I'm, not, I'm doing it because I'm trying to make a difference for our area. And I also don't think that we should superimpose it. I'm just trying to illuminate the choices. Illuminate the choices so that communities can make informed choices. We have a I'm lot not, of choices. So uh, I empathize with what you're saying, and I'm not tired. I'm going to keep working. Good. We're going to keep, we're going to keep working. Good. Thank you. Fred Bitterly, Hebron. Um, my, my question is, if we're talking energy, locally here, farmers that grow corn are being used to feed their livestock. But nationally, millions or billions of bushels of corn <laughs> are being grown every year and being turned into ethanol. Ethanol actually raises the price of fuel and lowers the quality. Now that corn should be used to both feed people as well as animals. And I'm wondering if there's anything you can do about that. Yeah. I, I have already taken one vote in the Congress to roll back and substitute ethanol. Uh, I don't think, look, you know, when you look at uh, the way we subsidize energy, the intent is to allow a new technology to get some traction and show its efficacy and going forward. We've been doing this for 30 years for ethanol, and we're long past the time when we should stop doing it. Uh, it, has, it has negative impacts on the inputs to our dairy farmers, but it actually has inputs, it has adverse impacts across our life. Uh, because when we subsidize this, it's actually impacting, it has indirect impacts on fast foods and, and any number of things in terms of the way we consume, we consume foods. So uh, I think we should stop the subsidies to, to ethanol. Uh, if we're going to talk buy it, there's, there, there are, you know, there's switchgrass, there's, I mean, there are some things that are worthwhile. That's in some cases in some of our counties, but, but not ethanol. Uh, I don't think that that's the, I don't think that's the way forward in terms of energy sources. I, and I, think, I expect more votes. Now, you know, the thing of it is, is this is a regional issue. This is not a Democrat Republican issue. This is a regional issue. There are parts of the country where both parties come together to support something like that. And where folks like myself have to work with across the aisle and to try to fight for family farmers, because this impacts our farmers. You know, this policy hurts our dairy farmers. It hurts, it, it hurts us in general, in, in, in that policy. So, you know, you can expect it, that we'll fight for that. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, what we'd like to ask people to do is go up the back. If you have a question, you come down this way. That's what it seems to be working real good. This is a quick one for the congressman. How much will the Ryan budget decrease the deficit? Okay. Uh, the, the Ryan, it's really our budget. You don't hide behind names. I, I say it's our budget now. I voted for it. It's a framework to go forward. Uh, does that mean it's perfect? No. Does that mean everything that's in it is going to become law? No. It's, it's, a, it's a plan to move us back towards a balanced budget. The Ryan plan takes 26 years. The Ryan, which is now my plan, which is the Republican plan, 
It takes 26 years back to about the budget. Okay? Uh, it reduces the, uh, the president's mark by $6.2 trillion. That's what the plan does. So uh, I think it's we can all get behind it. Uh, when you look at the two choices right now in our country, that is to say our budget and the president's budget, when you look at over time, in, in the year 2050, uh, which we hope that our next generation is flourishing by, the uh, Republican budget not only is running surpluses, but it actually halves the debt. Whereas the president's budget runs about $125 trillion worth of debt. So the choices are clear right now in terms of, in my mind, if you're interested in moving back to a balanced budget, moving towards surpluses, or paying down the debt, that the budget that brings is the right framework. Uh, going forward. So how much does it reduce the deficit? Your budget? Yeah. Uh, well, over you know how much? Over a decade, $6.2 trillion. $6.2 trillion. Thank you. Over the decade. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, my name is now, Pat. That, I'm sorry, that's in relation to the President's mark. That's in relation to the President's budget. That's how much it reduces the deficit. You mean more than his? Yes, reduces it 6.2 trillion. It takes 26 years to get back to a balanced budget. So you know, you're talking deficits uh, for some time. But here's the thing. I think, I think what's important is this. We need a vision that gets us back to where we need to be. We need a plan to get to that vision. And then we need the discipline to implement the plan. That's what I think is most important. You know, when s &P put that statement out yesterday, it, it was more of a statement of a lack of confidence that we would do what I just what I just mentioned. That's what they're worried about. And the world knows that if we commit ourselves to solving this, we'll not only solve it, we'll come out on the other side stronger. And that's what the world, we are, as you can tell, we're an anchor for the world right now. But if we don't change course, the anchor for the world, our country is going to go under. And that 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 is going to have repercussions all the way across the globe. And, and that's why I support this plan. You know, I'm being attacked for it already. People are saying they're calling it a drastic plan and everything like that. Look, I don't think it's drastic. I think it's necessary. I think it's a good starting point. You know, I don't know how you call a, a plan that balances the budget in 26 years drastic. I, I don't consider it, but I do think it's true uh, going forward. It's a step we need to take. Any, any rejoinder? Any, anything else that I need to clarify on that? I, I'm not really sure about the relationship you said with the $6.2 trillion and Obama. That went over my head. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, it's in relation to the president's budget, which generally drives the budgeting process. But the difference is now there's, there's a serious alternative in terms of levels of savings. And this one is $6.2 trillion lower than the president's mark. But I also want to be clear to you that even under this plan, our plan, uh, we still run deficits over the next decade, they're just increasingly less deficits. And the structural, the structural reforms that we put in place actually get us back to a balanced budget and get us to surpluses, uh, and then eventually start to pay down the debt. This is the plan that I think that we need going forward so that we can restore fiscal responsibility. But, but it won't be until for 10 years that we actually see a... Well, you'll see the differences right away, but it'll be 26 years before we balance. Thank you. My name is Catherine Rome. I'm from Greenwich. I just wanted to make sure I understood your position on Medicare, is that the program you're supporting would be to replace the system we have now with private insurers. So you would get a voucher, you'd get a set amount of money from the government, and then you would have to go try to shop whatever plan you could get from the insurers. No, it's, uh, thank you. it's not a voucher. Here's why I'm opposed to I, I look at this, I don't like the voucher program because I'm concerned we would end up with another bailout. This is what the, you know, when, uh, one of the things I really like about Congressman Ryan is he's not only very intelligent, he's a humble guy, you know, because I approached him a couple months ago and I said, I can't support a voucher program. Here's why. We, the country just went, we just talked about Wall Street, we talked about, what I don't want to see in the pattern is, is if, if we ever tried to privatize this thing and send checks to people, what if they get swindled? Are we the kind of country that people say, oh, well, you got your check, you're done? That's why I oppose vouchers, because I don't want to see us with a bailout program. I don't want us to see a situation where we have a series of seniors that end up getting swindled. What we need is a government program. The government is a, it's a set of pre-approved uh, plans that you would choose from. Now, uh, 
you know, we have Medicare Advantage right now. This is really the same thing as, as Medicare Advantage and Medicare Part D that we have. This would expand that program. For the seniors right now, I, I, that is not the right way to go. And, and for those that are current senior citizens, they, they live their whole life expecting a certain plan. That's what you said. For those that are 55 and older, 55 to 64, they need time to prepare for, you know, that kind of change in our system. But those 54 year to keep the program, to stabilize the program, as somebody used, somebody used earlier, we need to take certain reforms to stabilize the program. I think this is a good model. And I, I think it's a good way to start talking. Now, it's also income sensitive. It looks at those who are at the poverty line and 150% of the poverty line. And it looks at those in the top 2%. And it's a fiscally responsible way to try to preserve the program. We're still willing to, I mean, I'm so still, still willing to look at other proposals that come forward, but they got to be serious. They have to be serious proposals that address our circumstances. I, I'm not sure if I understand, because if you're not in favor of a voucher plan, right. then where would the money come from? This is a premium that comes from us. It's a premium support. And how would that save money if you don't have a, uh, a voucher plan? Yeah, well, the first thing it does is, is that uh, when you go with uh, the pre-approved plans, right, you have oversight over a system that right now does not have oversight. So you have somebody who's a provider with a tax ID, they can send a bill in to the U.S. government. And some of you may have seen some of the exposés. This has been found to be right for fraud, waste, and abuse because we have really no way of providing oversight. We just pay the bill. and people send the bill and we pay it. What this does is it helps provide oversight because now you have government pre-approved plans that are saying, wait a minute, what's with this bill? We haven't seen it. We contact the individual and say, did you go see the doctor? No, I didn't see the doctor. I think in the first order instances, it will it will cut, it will save money, but it will also have a deterrent value against, against uh, fraud recently. So you're saying that the government would approve and limit the number of plans you could choose from? And they would be private insurance companies. The, the, this would be a series of about six pre-approved plans, and you would get to choose among these as to what kind of. And the government would decide what kind of benefits you get. The government would pick the six pre-approved plans. Six. And Thank but, you. But there's, I think that's important because we don't want to have a situation where I don't think we want to have a situation where you end up with a fly-by-night company that. I mean, look at right now. There are seniors that get things in the mail that say Social Security is being privatized. Send 100 bucks. We have constituents. I see it all. I go to 137 towns. You've got organizations that are ripping off our seniors. They're saying, we're going to advocate to make sure you don't privatize. Send us 100 bucks. And <laughs> soon, if you went to a voucher program, we'd have the same issue. I think we'd end up with the same issue. We would end up with, with, uh, with fraud on our seniors. That's why, I, that's why I think government needs to be involved. That's why I want to stabilize. <laughs> I want to stabilize the program going forward. Okay. We talk about energy costs. My name is Bob Naylor from West Haven. We talk about the energy costs going up all the time. We uh, subsidize big oil with uh, lots of money. Okay, they get rich off us. We don't see them kicking in anything on the problems that we're having today. We look at the news reports. They tell us there's really no shortage, that it's a lot of, most of it is all speculation. We're driven by a speculating market. Why are we not doing something to try to control how these speculators are coming in and driving that price up? Okay, those are good questions. Uh, the first thing, with regard to subsidies for oil companies, I think the time has ended for that. Uh, you know, I, look, the oil companies do just fine on their own. I would like to see a situation where those kind of investments actually go towards uh, some of the renewables, including nuclear power, because I think it would be safer if we actually did the research and development and incorporated some of the things that uh, overseas in Europe, and also the nanotechnology in all of them. I think that there's more than there's research that needs to be done to perfect that. So I would like to see the money that should get those to subsidize oil companies who are very mature in terms of their abilities to withdraw uh, and, and to have that go into a renewable, renewable energy. Now, the speculation thing, look, uh, I'm asking those questions, uh, and, and I, that is, what I'm hearing is that the preponderance of this situation is caused by the supply and interruptions that occurred from overseas and other places. So, uh, I mean, it, it, it's right to raise that as, as a question, um, but to me, I think it has to do uh, with, with supply issues, and if you think about Think about what happened in our country in the summer of 2007. In the summer of 2007, uh, gasoline prices jumped over $4 a gallon. 
And then, by the holiday period, they went all the way down to about 150. In fact, as we were driving back to Fort Bragg from, from Indra to go back to work, uh, you know, we, there was a gas station in New Jersey. It was $1.37. You know, and, I, and that was it was incredible. So I think that that what happened is, is there was a, there was then a glut in the market uh, of supply that caused a drop in the in the prices. So you know, I, I think that we would impact this if we increased our supply. If we increased our supply, I think now do I think that there's some elasticity in that? That is to say, as soon as we start injecting supply, do I think that that would also have perhaps more than a one to one effect? I do. I do think that it would happen. So, you know, that there is something to markets, I think, that are impacted. Uh, but anyways, that, that's my perspective on, on this piece here. Thank you. How you doing? My name's Ed Miller. I've been living in Salem here for 27 years. And I just want to touch on a couple of issues here. Now, uh, Steve had brought up the, uh, the union deal now. Now, I was in union corporate for over 30 years out of Albany. Now, I have no say, I've been a registered Republican, I had no say of where my money went, okay, as far, well, you know, we went to the Democratic Party, as we all know. <laughs> and I, I just can't believe uh, the, uh, what's going to happen in this country here, I believe, is going to be some uprisings here. Because you have these George Soros, you have these Bill Ayers. I, I, I believe what's going to happen is when we start really getting into all these uh, issues about entitlements, that there's going to be an uprising because all these animals from the left are going to come out. All these socialists and communists are going to come out of the woodwork like they are right now. And we have to try to do something here to keep an eye on the ball because I believe it's going to get out of control. I hope it doesn't get out too far out of control. And I just hope there's something you can do about it. And I, and I believe what you're saying tonight, so far from what I heard, sounds good. Okay. Now, hold on, I got one other thing. That that was only that was only just a small topic here. What what I want to really talk about is our borders. Okay. That's that's what I really want to hear an answer on. They're coming over, the Mexicans. I believe you got Al Qaeda. I believe you have Hezbollah, and who knows who's coming in here besides these drug cartels, because I believe the drug cartels are working with these people to come in here, and our country, we can, we can talk about all of this, what we're talking about here tonight, what's going on here, but I mean, if we don't do something about this, we're not even going to have a country, okay? We're not going to have a country, because they're going to come in here, and they're going to start all kinds of crap, and it's going to get worse. I mean, it might not happen overnight, but... You're talking about going to two, uh, you know, 2020 and 30 and beyond, and our kids and everything else. But I mean, you know, how do you feel about it? Thank you. Uh, well, you know, first of all, uh, let me say this: that I, I believe in the goodness of our country. Uh, as I said in my preface remarks, we certainly have. This is a very emotional time. People on uh, one side or the other. Uh, we have seen that erupt. We've seen issues with this, but uh, I, I believe that our country can absolutely come together and solve this. Uh, I mean, uh, yes, I'm in the Republican Party, but I would tell you, I look at this in a very pragmatic way. I look at it as a guy who was a soldier, who had missions, and had to accomplish missions. And so I'm trying to be a person that, while we never want to give up our, our right to disagree and have different views on issues, that somebody who that can help lead us towards a situation where we grow our economy, where we balance our budgets, and where we protect our cherished way of life, which I think all of us can agree that we really never want to let go. So, uh, you know, I, I'm going to continue to work hard on this. I'm going to, every day I'm going to get up and I'm going to do that and try to lead by example and try to be somebody who can bring people together uh, because I believe we absolutely can do it. And with regard to immigration, look, uh, we, are, we are a nation of laws. And we're a nation of immigrants. Well, thank God that this DREAM Act didn't go through. Are you kidding me? Well, here's what I'm saying. You know what I mean? The DREAM Act. Well, yeah, we is, got dreams, all right. This, this, is, this is our challenge. Is we have to find a way to reconcile the fact that we are a nation of laws and we're a nation of immigrants. My family, I, I remember, you know, yes, I'm going to get to that. And I'm going to get to that in a second. I'm, I'm going to get to that in a second. You know, I, I just want to share with you how powerful our identity is. 
uh, there was a moment in graduate school when epiphany, I had, an, I had one of these moments, right? Uh, I grew up being very enamored with our country's history, particularly the founding era. And, uh, you know, all the Jefferson, Madison, Hamilton, Washington. There was a moment in graduate school when I kind of went, holy smokes, my family wasn't even here then. That's how strong our identity is to our way of life. That we could have people who are here one generation and study our history and treat it as if it's their family's own history. So we are a family, we are a nation of immigrants. And we're a nation of laws. You know, I can understand that. I, well, I, know, I know what you're saying. But illegal immigrants. Why don't we do something with the illegal that are coming over? Again, and then you got a California over there, and they give them health care and everything else. That'll solve the whole freaking body, the, the problem right there. Yes, sir. This, this Billions of dollars. This is where I'm going. We we are at once a nation of immigrants and we're a nation of laws. So if we don't enforce our laws, why not? Then who are we? Right? So what we have to do is this is what I think is what we should do going forward. Number one is we need to secure our borders. We need to secure our borders because we can't enforce our laws. How many years have we been saying that, Mr. Gibson? How many years are we going to keep going? We can case up five years from now. We've got to do something about the borders. Well, it's going to be too late. Now, I think that I do believe that among those that I serve with now, there's a recognition that we have to secure our borders. And after, after we secure our borders, then what we need to do is we need to take a look at our policy, our immigration policy. Do you think we got the policy right? The policy itself. I don't think so. Here's why. Because I tend to go to supply and demand. And you look at our farmers here, they don't have access to the labor that they need. We don't have the policy right. We need to get the policy right. And then finally, we need to figure out what to do with those. Come over and build a fence. How about that? You come over here to Mexico and you know, come out and build a fence. <laughs> well, you know, that sounds good. So, so, all right, maybe that's a little unreasonable. I, I think there's a rational way to go forward that we're going to be able to uh, bring closure mm -hmm. to this issue. Because I'll tell you, there is one thing that you're saying that's absolutely true, is the fact that our taxes are higher right now because there are people in our country that are not paying their taxes because they're here illegal. And that's got to be addressed. They're like GE. Yeah. Well, GE needs to pay their fair share too, right? <laughs> no, I support that too. But, uh, but look, uh, what we can't do is, here's, here's the thing. As we tackle this stuff, this tough issue, if we go to each other's corners and just yell at each other, we're never going to solve it. What we need is a practical way forward. And I think I have a practical way forward that's balanced, right? The, the first step is, is to secure the borders. That includes an obstacle. I mean, you know, given my background, if you're going to secure it, you need, you need an obstacle. Okay. And an obstacle is not an obstacle unless you surveil it. You've got to watch it. So that, that includes uh, a mixture of both human and non-human non beings to secure the border. That's number one. Number two is you need to get the policy right. Because we don't, we don't have the policy right. We need, we need access to uh, those that are willing to come here legally and work with us, you know, just for our farmers. Number three is we need a means to address the illegal immigrants that are in this country now. Here's what I suggest. The first thing is, is for those that are here that come forward and plead guilty. That is to say they acknowledge that they broke our laws, that they pay a back fine, that they pay a back fine. In some cases, they can't afford to pay it right away, but they got to agree to garnish because then they'll pay the taxes that we're paying. Okay? Then they, there needs to be a background check to make sure that we're not naturalizing murderers or drug dealers. And then they need to get in line. And if they're willing to do that, then I say they can stay and naturalize. If they're not willing to do that, they need to go back. Because if they don't be guilty, then they, they haven't recognized that they broke our laws. I think that's reasonable. And I don't think that should be a felony. I know what you're saying, but the thing is, what I'm trying to get at is, okay, everybody has to work, everybody wants to work, they want to come over here. But the borders are so coarse right now, Terrorism could be coming into our country, and it, it doesn't matter. I mean, they're not doing anything. No, I, I agree with you. Uh, you know what I mean? That's the bottom line. But I think that there's a, I do think that there's a rational way forward to address the issue. Look, I know you're just getting your engine started. You just got into the business, but you and your constituents got a good head of steam going, and you do the right thing. <laughs> Hi, my name is Irv DeBattis. I'm from Queensbury, New York. I'm like the congressman there. I spent several years, sorry, Navy, 24. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, I've been around a while, and uh, I think I got a pretty good grasp on some of all of what's been talked about here tonight. And there's, it strikes me that there's two things, and you hit upon them right at the very start. 
we have to grow our economy. That means putting people back to work and giving them something to do, something meaningful to do. Number two, we have to control our spending because if we always spend more than what we bring in, what our uh, gross national product is, it's not going anywhere. So I would say the most prosperous time that I can remember that this country ever had was from about 1947 to perhaps 1960, maybe 65 as you stretch it. And what happened during that time? We had an industrial-based economy and shipped three-quarters of the, the goods that were consumed in the entire world out of this country. We brought some things in, but we shipped a heck of a lot more out than what we brought in. And people had to produce those goods. We went to an information age, technology age, a dot-com thing. Where did that lead us? Not very far. The dot-com thing drove it down when all that went bust. So I say that we took and we kicked the foundation right out from under our house. What we need is an industrial-based economy. Now, I'm not saying that the technology isn't good. It certainly is. I believe that the technology may be even the answer to this because people say, well, we can't compete with the other countries. But I think we can. We've got the technology and the people that could do this. After World War II and during World War II, we brought this country up from, from nothing in a short order. It didn't take 26 years. We did it really, really fast. And we put everybody to work. And I think that's what we need to do again. I'd like your opinion on that. Thanks, sir. Uh, a lot of what you say there, uh, you know, I, I agree with that. I, I think we should recognize that one of the things we benefited from in uh, the post-war war, uh, period is that our country, we were fortunate, our, our economy was not wrecked, uh, whereas a lot of the world was. And so when the demand mm -hmm. started kicking in, we had the factories, we had the wherewithal, we had the labor that could actually produce the goods for the rest of the world. And that's part of why we grew in the, in the manner that we did. You know, even now, after all this time, who leads the world in manufacturing? Well, we're still we're still up there, but we still bring everything in from China. No, you're right. There are issues with trade, uh, but I think it's still important to know we not only lead the world in manufacturing, we lead by two and a half times the next closest country. That's not why we know. Now that also broadens the definition of manufacturing to include microchips and the semiconductor industry. Mm -hmm. And you know, going forward in the 21st century, I think that uh, that we will continue to lead the way as long as we have the ingenuity and the creativity to create new goods that nobody else can, can produce. That's why intellectual property rights are so important to us when we do trade agreements. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to see our stuff knocked off. Uh, because when we go through it, we pay our labor. And we're happy to do it. Because we have smart people and we want to make sure we want to see business win, we want to see workers win, we want to see America win. Uh, it was interesting to me when I took a brief on this and you know, look, looking at competitiveness of American companies, there's, there's a bit of a misnomer out there. People think that the reason why we're not competitive is because we pay our workers so much. That's not no, true. No. That's not true at all. The biggest reason why is taxes and regulations that hurt mm -hmm. our competitiveness. Mm -hmm. But you know, part of it is, is the way we tax. You know, I mean, it was just mentioned. You know, we have the second highest corporate tax rate, but yet how is it we have corporations that aren't paying any tax? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the casualty is this, is we end up incentivizing corporations to do stuff overseas. Mm -hmm. We need to close those, those tax uh, those tax loopholes, and then be in a position where we can lower marginal tax rates, and we should, should address some of the regulation. Look, I, I would tell you one of the, one of the sad, uh, this is tragic, but uh, you know, the circumstance in Japan and the trade of the families, I and mean, then it's all said and done, maybe, I mean, when you add those who are be known to be killed and to those missing, I mean, it may exceed 30,000 mm -hmm. lives, not to mention lives that are forever changed, they never be the same, mm -hmm. lost their homes. I, I was visiting a company in Albany, and the company was actually waiting on a park from Japan, and they were seriously considering a company in Syracuse, and this, this was tilting that that decision in that direction. I only bring that up to tell you that we're not far off. Some of our companies, their competitiveness, they're not that far off. So if we, if we can work taxes, regulation, healthcare costs, and energy costs, we and, and, and we address these things, we may be in a situation where we're able to permit, create more jobs right here. But let me say this too on, on free trade. 
uh, there was a comment that came out today that the, uh, the trade representative for our country has just uh, looked at uh, Panama and has given it the green light. Uh, I think this is going to be important. We've got three free trade agreements that are coming forward this year. Uh, South Korea, Panama, and Colombia. And I think these, these agreements are going to help our companies going forward. Uh, you know, we actually benefited. We actually benefited in a strange way politically. Right? Because President Obama opposed those free trade agreements. But when he came in, he actually worked a better deal for us. Particularly for our beef industry. So uh, he kind of played good cop, bad cop mm -hmm. in a way. And it actually got us a better deal. So now what I think is important, we need to bring these before the Congress this year and approve them. Because I think that that will help our economy going forward. So uh, it, it, it's certainly a complex thing that you described. Mm -hmm. But I think you're right to say that we, we need that investment uh, in the foundation. Uh, and somebody who's concerned about national security, uh, I, I would tell you that it concerns me when we start uh, relying on countries overseas to produce key aspects of our defense. We don't want that either. You know, if, that, that makes us reliant. If they ever, if they ever quit selling to us, we, yeah. we'd be a. Well, this is why you know, water fleet arsenal. You know, the water fleet arsenal is really the only place in America where we create cannons for our artillery. Mm -hmm. So when you see, even though that's not in the district, I work with Representative Tonka mm -hmm. to help support Puerto Rico Arsenal, and it's because I believe that this is going to help strengthen our country and provide for a stronger national security. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Bob Seller. Uh, give Chris a break for a minute and bring in a little bit more local. Um, both Betty and Tony talked about uh, mandate reform for schools. I spent a lot of the last two years at school board meetings in our town and uh, watched the board struggle with uh, so many mandated programs that they couldn't touch. And uh, this year when I asked what specific input they had given to both of your offices, I got blank stares. Uh, are you getting good specific information from people? And if not, could you send them a letter and ask? Because they're not doing it on their own. Actually, you know, it's the, the best information we've got has been from our local superintendents. We've met with, either we've spoken on the phone, or I think I've met with over the last two years, every superintendent of the schools in our district. And you know, one of the best ones comes from Ryan Sherman from Skyland. He says, state, stop mandating seat time. You know, it kind of makes it visual. The state tells a school like Argyle, you have to educate your kids the same way public school 69 does in Brooklyn. And they're vastly different. And you know, I think the one message we're trying to bring is we are very different. So give us objectives, give us standards to meet, state ed department, but don't tell us how to get there. Because how you educate a child in Newcomb with five kids mm -hmm. is going to be vastly different than Saratoga Springs or Salem or Greenwich or Cambridge or Houston Falls. And so, you know, some of the more interesting things I learned was from our but that was who. So they, they have been, for a while they were my poster child, and a few that got back. So you know, they have been. Um, it's burdensome, but what we did differently this year is say, give us real examples as a percentage of your budget. Because for Salem School, $55,000 is a pretty significant number. To Denny Farrell, who's the, he runs the Ways and Means for the Democratic Assembly, that's about five minutes of educating one of the schools in his district. So as a percentage, it makes a real difference. So that's where our fight is to try to get this. And I think this government has shown real commitment to leading by example and reigning in the agencies. Because you know, the agencies are independent fiefdoms at times who mandate without checks and balances from the voters. And so that so we are getting good feedback from them. Yeah, um, the Department has looked at some of the mandates and they actually are removing some of them. And I think this is all because of the focus on mandate relief right from the governor's office all the way down. I'm on that commission on mandate relief and you know we keep getting more looking at them. First of all, constitutional amendment, they can't have a mandate without having the state funding come from it. Some of the big ones for the school districts are we have the federal mandates for special education and we add state mandates to it. We have federal mandates for academic intervention and we add state mandates to it. If we could go with the federal and say the state mandates are guidelines 
for what's appropriate in that particular school district and giving some flexibility. We have teacher mentoring programs that there's a cost involved and they, every school is required to do one. We had a teacher that went to a new school, got a job at Queensbury. She had taught 14 years. She had to have a teacher mentor who was being paid. She had to have paperwork. They had someone over the program. Said once she knew where the teacher's lounge and the restroom were, she was okay. <laughs> so there's so many programs that are out there, you know, that we're going to correct this evil or this bad thing, and instead we blanket the whole thing. One on the, the school buses, and this came up in our meeting. Every school believes that they're required to have a seat on the bus for every student that's in that school district. A parent is not allowed to sign a waiver from bus transportation. And then we have to build parking lots for the students who drive to school. And I respect your point of view, and I want to thank our state senator and assemblyman for being here tonight. Thank you very much.